Welcome to the fine print, ladies and gentlemen. There's usually some volume there on that on that video. I think I fucked it up. Anyway, um, be, before I bring on my next guest, we got a great guest tonight. Uh, she she's waiting in the back. Um, I want to thank everybody who tuned in to to my interview with uh, David Rabinovitz to talk about um, real estate deals and restructuring debt i want to thank everybody who also uh tuned in to my interview with stacy Wachrowski. stacy i hope you're having fun out in dc there yep and charles alkire yes sir um as you can see once again wait 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 there we go once again we got once again we got the don't don't be an asshole that's uh, my man will see Willie Wheels out in Burlington. I'd like to thank him for blessing my studio with some amazing artwork. Forbin's finest, as you can see up here. I got my Forbin's hoodie on. Yeah. Uh, this is some some of my favorite people in Vermont. Um, Tom the Ganja Delivery Guy, another great man. Um, so let's go ahead, dude. Uh, tonight we got a great interview. I'm, I'm going to bring her on right now. Bang. Hey. It's Tess. <laughs> Tess, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thanks for having me. Wait, whoa. Where's the volume? Oh. Shit. No. We have to fix this. I got no volume. Everything's okay on my end. <laughs> nope. Shit. We should we should have tried this out before. Hang on. Nope. Nope. Shit. We should have done a test run. All my levels a lot. All my levels are up. Shit. How's it? Hey, there we go. Yeah. Hey. hey. It's it's Tess Adam, PhD microbiologist. <laughs> but apparently do not know how to use uh, headphones in 2023. <laughs> Tess, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's, yeah, it's my honor, man. Um, I, I was hoping before we get started that you would share with us your five-minute life story. Sure. Um, so I am a scientist, but I started out um, as a little kid growing up in Nebraska, just being a nerd, loving Star Trek, loving my science classes. Um, just kept going to school until I couldn't go to school anymore is kind of how it ended up. Uh, I got my PhD in microbiology, developing a potential new class of antibiotics and um, continued my research um, out here in Colorado. So I, I did my PhD in Rochester. So I moved from Nebraska, which I never thought I'd ever leave Nebraska. Um, moved to Rochester, New York, did my PhD there, met my husband there, and then we moved to Colorado. And um, I continued my research, went on to be a program manager for a science and technology center then uh, moved back to New York to be a professor and uh, did that for a little while and then found myself um, kind of landing in the cannabis industry about uh, three and a half years ago or so. And I started, I got my start as an extractor. So I was the laboratory manager for Columbia Care in Rochester, New York. And um, I did all the extraction, distillation, processing, isolation. So we had a huge prep SFC, um, supercritical fluid, chromatography, purification system, which was really cool. And then New York at the time finally started to allow flour to be sold. Um, but the limits were really, really strict. And um, I got to put my microbiology hat back on again. I had done um, some food safety work, uh, running a fermented foods company with my husband when I was, when we were both in Colorado. 
And I was like, all right, I know how to do some HACCP stuff, which is hazard analysis of critical control points. And I know how to do some environmental monitoring and confirming like very quickly if a surface is clean and stuff like that. And so we got an environmental monitoring program and a quality program kind of up and running at our facility in Rochester, then moved back out to Colorado uh, about two years ago and have been basically working, uh, helping folks try to clean up their grows and um, build these hazard analysis plans kind of more in line with how food safety works. So I've been trying to bring in all these good practices from the food industry and manufacturing and start finding ways that they can fit in the cannabis space so that uh, cultivators and manufacturers can really trust their process and be proactive in their microbial control. And there's other hazards too, besides just microbes. Mm. And that's what I do now. And I do some research now too. I'd like to back you up a little bit. Could you but tell back. us? Could you tell us what you did for your grad work and maybe for your your doctoral work? Yeah, yeah. So uh, my PhD focused on um, uh, developing a new class of antibiotics. So when you look at the clinically available antibiotics that are out there, so things that you get when you are sick, and uh, they might do some lab work on, like if you have a, a a wound that won't heal or maybe a lung infection that might do some lab work and figure out what kind of microbes are in there first before they start uh, giving you antibiotics. And those antibiotics are really only targeting a handful of what we call essential pathways within the bacterial cell. So when you think about a human body, it's pretty easy to think about essential pathways, like your brain is essential. You take that out of the equation, you're no longer alive your heart is essential. You know, if you take out both kidneys, that's not good. But if you only have one, there's a redundancy there. So <laughs> did you want to hop in? <laughs> no, I just had to make a face there because that was a good point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Continue. Yeah. So just like humans have like essential organs that we need to survive, there are pathways within bacterial cells that are also essential. And if you interrupt those pathways, which antibiotics typically are small molecule inhibitors, they're little molecules that go in and jam up uh, a different pathway so that that cell can no longer run its assembly line the way that it's supposed to, for whatever reason, it either blocks the cell wall synthesis or it punches holes in the cell membranes, or it interrupts protein synthesis. Those are the major, major ways that antibiotics work. And importantly, they don't target those pathways within the host because you want to kill the bacteria, but not kill the human that is, the, that is, you know, the incubator for the organism. Yes, it's important. And so you want to target pathways that are really specific to bacteria um, and not specific to humans, but that are essential to bacteria. And so my, uh, the targets that I was trying to hit are these molecules that uh, recycle RNA. So um, without getting too uh, into molecular biology. Get into it, I don't care. <laughs> okay. go, go ahead, okay. Tess. Okay, cool. So every single cell has its DNA blueprint, right? It's, it's, the it's the same for humans, it's the same for plants, it's the same for bacteria, fungi. They all have a DNA blueprint that encodes all of the genes that that organism needs to survive. But not all the genes are made all at the same time. They are selectively chosen. It's why your brain cell is different than a heart cell is different than a lung cell, because the genes that are expressed in those organs are different. And so your DNA blueprint is selectively curated and certain genes are taken and made copies out of. That process is called transcription. So DNA is made into RNA, and then that RNA will turn into a protein, which are the little enzyme machines. I won't get into RNAs that are functional because there are some of those, but basically after that RNA is made, that RNA needs to be degraded. So you need to make, make that RNA from the DNA, then that RNA will be translated into protein, which is the enzyme, which is the structural protein, which is basically the functional part of that gene. And then after it's after the RNA has that middleman, that messenger RNA has done its job, then that RNA gets degraded. 
if you inhibit that process of degradation um, and processing through small molecule inhibitors, that pathway is really specific in bacteria. There's not a lot of similar enzymes that overlap between bacterial RNA turnover and human RNA turnover. Oh, so you can act small Pop molecule. It. S small molecule inhibitors. Could you explain that a little bit to us? Yeah, yeah. So small molecule inhibitors are um, exactly what they sound like. They're usually, I think they have to be below a molecular weight of 250 or 300. Um, you're calling on a lot of memories I've forgotten. Um, but they're basically like little molecules that gum up an enzymatic process. And um, most of most of the traditional antibiotics that we know of are small molecule inhibitors. There's a couple of exceptions, um, but it's basically an antibiotic or before it's characterized and identified. And so what my lab did is we wanted to target this uh, RNA turnover enzyme called RNPA or RNAs P. And it's very specific in bacteria. There aren't many uh, similar proteins in humans with some caveats. There's an asterisk there, but we can talk an about asterisk. that later. Asterisk. <laughs> that's, that's my logo. There you go. Yeah. Um, so, so we could target. So we did this big high throughput screen looking for small molecules that would, um, would hit that enzyme through an enzymatic assay. We found like several dozen hits. We went on to further characterize those. And then every time you uh, are identifying antibiotics, you have to confirm the mechanism of action. And that mechanism of action, what that means is, how does it work to kill the cell? How is it, what is it gumming up? What is it messing up with that is killing? Because you just see the cells dying. You don't really know why they're dying. Um, and so we generated different mutants. We generated uh, knockdowns. So we're able to reduce the endogenous levels of that RNAs that I was targeting. And we could show that when we reduced the levels of the target, we didn't need as much of the antibiotic. There, um, there was a couple other experiments that we did to uh, show that it was targeting this pathway where other known um, inhibitors actually target too. And so if you hit multiple steps within the same pathway, you actually get a synergistic response. It's kind of like the entourage effect that you hear a lot about in cannabis. Uh, that's called synergy. It's very common and well-studied in different types of antibiotics. And so we, we saw some synergistic activity where basically the sum, so like if you treated with one antibiotic, um, and, and you, you got a certain result, you treated with another biotic, you got another result, you treated with them both, you get, instead of just two times what you saw, you're getting exponential. So it's like, it's like one plus one equals seven. Exactly. I'm exactly. Sorry, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And so we saw some synergy, um, paper came out. I, I wrote a paper on it. I've got a couple of papers on different RNA inhibitors and I continue, continue my work, uh, with. RNA in my postdoc research. So I'm really an RNA person. I love RNA. It's that middleman, the messenger RNA. Uh, viroids are RNAs too. So if anyone's heard of hoplate and viroids, they're basically hijacking parasitic circular RNAs. They're pretty darn cool. Very similar to some RNA molecules that I studied in my postdoc um, uh, that are non-coding in human and other mammalian RNAs. These are also non-coding viroids. Don't code for anything. They don't make anything. They don't make any protein. They just keep making more copies of themselves because that's what they do. <laughs> so yeah, that's, uh, that's the research that I did. So I had, um, it was very cool because my, uh, my graduate student advisor, Dr. Paul Dunman at the University of Rochester, he worked in industry, so he worked um, for different pharmaceutical companies for several mm -hmm. years. And then Rochester, came, Rochester in New York. He didn't work at, at those uh, pharmaceutical companies in Rochester. He worked at them, you know, in like Boston and other places where they all are. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> carry so on. He worked in industry. He actually, I actually started in his lab in Nebraska. So he went to Nebraska and then our whole lab moved to Rochester, New York. So um, I got the the fun experience of moving 
an entire lab a thousand miles across the country. So, um, yeah, that yeah. must be that must be wild, huh? Yeah, like, yeah. Yep. I, I, I have some friends that have built labs in Massachusetts at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, um, and uh, yeah, seemed like they had a great time. What, what what was that like for you? Oh man, well, I mean. Moving's always hard, but then moving all the science equipment and your big minus 80 degree Celsius freezers that and you're like stuffing them with dry ice and like hoping that they stay nice and cold. So your samples don't all get destroyed during transit. Um, it was fun. I have to say it, I really bonded with the other lab uh, with my lab mates, with the other grad students. Uh, we, you know, uh, went through that entire process together. So you build a lot of good memories. Um, and then we set everything up and started rocking and rolling, like within a few weeks of, uh, getting all set up and getting our biosafety clearance going and everything. And we we're just back up and running pretty much immediately. So yeah, it was, it was a fun experience. And then, then I had to learn Rochester, uh, which, uh, being a Nebraska girl who's used to grid systems, People should have grid systems. Your streets should go north and south and east and west, not like the spider web, like is everywhere on the East Coast. <laughs> so that was fun. But yeah, that's that's what I worked on um, for my graduate studies. Um, one of the first notes that I have here is about the um, E-Valley popcorn mm. type of shit. Um um, and it says in my notes, talk to her about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you had another um, speaker on. I'm told Jeff. I can't remember his last Jeff name. Jeff Rawson. Yes. Yeah. And he was talking about his experience with that. And I think in our little pre-show interview, we were we were briefly chatting about that. So that a valley a valley, um, is is the popcorn lung that was associated with vaping. Um, that basically, I think that we brought it up in the context that a lot of it is attributed to vitamin E acetate, which if anyone's ever done any formulating, you know, if you, if you make distillate, distillate's really viscous, it's super thick and you almost need a, you know, like a thinning agent in order to fill and pack those base Comment. cartridges. Comment for you there. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Go ahead, Tess. <laughs> I'm doing it, Lou. Yeah. Carry, <laughs> carry on, please, Tess. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so so when you're filling up, you know, your cartridges, you want to thin that out. And I think a lot of black market uh, products, um, both on, uh, nicotine and cannabis or, or cannabinoid um, containing cartridges, I, I think there was like some, maybe early on in the vape days, some manufacturers were using vitamin E acetate, but it seemed to be more of a underground black market um, uh, ingredient that was used. And, and it's perfectly fine to eat and consume, but it's really, really bad to vaporize and inhale. And that's <laughs> why, why and, is that? Why is that, Tess? I actually don't know the underlying mechanism for that. Um, I, I it, it seemed like it was necrotic in some way. I'm not exactly sure what, it, why. Maybe Jeff would know a little bit more about that. But um, yeah, I mean, it seems like folks just had yes. crazy inflammation and crazy like damage to their lungs within a very short period of time. And I know that when it first happened, it was very difficult to characterize and really pinpoint and trace back because again, most people don't want to admit that they uh, use, you know, a Schedule One drug, even though it might be legal in their state. Um, and you know, even even nicotine, a lot of people don't necessarily um, want to, you know, tell their doctor that oh, that could be linked to this. So it took time to figure out where and, and to really pinpoint the root cause of why people were having these popcorn lung issues. And it was really pinpointed down to vitamin E acetate, which again, is something that you can eat, but not good to smoke um, and, or to vaporize and inhale. So yeah. that's that's the distinction is when you're breathing something in, I think that we were, might've been talking about this in our little pre-show interview too. When we you're might. breathing something in, it's 
pretty different from when you're eating something. And and, and uh, why is that? Could you explain that to us? Route of administration. <laughs> so, uh, you know, any, any, there's like different routes of, this is bringing me back to my, my days as an undergraduate researcher where I would <laughs> gavage mice. So you'd stick a little needle with a ball at the end down the throats of poor little mices. And you'd just be like, oh, you'd, you'd inject their stomach essentially oh. with different drugs. Yeah. I'm a mice. I'm a mouse murderer, but I don't do it anymore. I'm reformed. I, but <laughs> I had some friends from college that also uh, murdered mice. Yep. Carry it on. Was for science, but still. Um, yeah. So there's different routes. So there's like subcutaneous, there's cutaneous, there's sublingual. So it's un under the tongue um, where there can be some exchange of, um, you know, nutrients, there's suppository, you know, rectal or vaginal, there's oral. So that's when you're eating something. Um, and then there's inhalation. And I'm sure that there's more that I haven't thought of. Um, and basically, you know, the route of how you are interacting with something um, really depends on how that's going to get taken up into your bloodstream, um, how it's going to be processed by the liver. Uh, so most of the, when you eat something, most of the time it has to go through your liver first and then it get, then it can, you know, go throughout the rest of your bloodstream. If you, you know, use suppositories, you kind of bypass that and it kind of just directly gets taken up into your blood. So there's there, and your lungs are the same way too, where, you know, you have little, <laughs> little, yeah, <laughs> butt stuff. I made butt yeah. stuff. Yeah, I do sometimes, <laughs> sometimes and, and laugh. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and then your lungs, you know, gas exchange happens in these little tiny sacs at the end of your bronchioles, which are like branches. So your lungs have all these branches. And at the end of those branches are teeny, teeny, tiny, tiny, tiny little sacs where air exchange happens where there's lots of venation. So there's lots of gas exchange going on between uh, veins and the air and all this other stuff. Um, so it depends on what you're create, like what the substance is and depends on the route of administration uh, on how that affects you. And then people's metabolisms all play a role. Back when I was a graduate student um, and an undergrad, I sold my body to science to make money because I was a poor grad student. And so I'd go, I think it was like phase three clinical trials. I was a healthy individual. So they had, <laughs> they had already tested drugs. I had to, I had to plug back in here. You, you sold your body to science. I did. I, did. Yeah. I, I made money and then I went scuba diving. <laughs> we got a comment here from adventure all day. Ha ha. College friends. Ryan S. I don't. <laughs> hmm. All right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> I like your story more. Yeah. Yeah. So like, you know, there's different, there's different, even with uh clinical trials, like if you're doing an, an inhalation route versus oral, like you gotta do different time courses to see how long it stays in people's systems. That's what I I was the guinea pig for those experiments. They would dose me and then they draw my blood every 15 minutes for four hours, every half an hour for four hours, every hour for four oh. hours. And then they look to see how much tighter of the drug was in my blood, basically. What, what was this experiment? Uh, so these are different phase three, I think clinical trials. One was like a, oh. one was like a heart attack, like recovery pill. And my mom was like, don't do that one. And I was like, but it's paying me. So I'm gonna do it. And the other one was like an acid reflux drug. So it wasn't a, a big deal. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So it, was, it wasn't cannabis related. No, this was way back in the day. I'm talking okay. like, oh. yeah, like 2005, <laughs> 2008, somewhere around there. Mm. Um, one of the things I want to talk to you about, Tess, is remediation in the cannabis uh, industry. The R word. <laughs> yeah. Is that a bad word? Um, I would say it. Uh, yes. Yeah. I'm just, I'm not even going to be on the fence about it. Yeah. Remediation. So, all right. So let's back up a little bit. So there are different types of decontamination methods or what we call um, 
process control steps in food safety. So these are different steps within your um, process, <laughs> hence the process part of process control that uh, allows you to control a specific microbial risk. So a lot of times it's cooking, you know, you're gonna cook raw ingredients. Um, sometimes it's drying something out so that there's not a lot of water there. When my husband and I had fermented foods, it was salt concentration and pH. So if you have a low pH below 4.2, basically pathogens can't grow. And so uh, you have to have special certification for high acid foods, uh, better process control, stuff like that. But there's different steps that you can take to reduce the negative impact of microbes. And those steps are done preventively in the food industry. Meaning if you're going to use something like irradiation or ozone, which are microbial reduction uh, technologies that are used in food, um, then you can only use that in line with your good practices. So it's not used like the way it is in cannabis, which is to recover adulterated product. And by adulterated, I mean the microbial levels or the microbial constituents, the microbes that are actually there are either too high or certain pathogens are present. And so you have failed your microbial test. And yeah, yeah. So that, so when you fail, you know, you have, it's what's considered an adulterated product. Um, so for example, if I was growing leafy greens and uh, I sent out samples to be tested and they tested positive for E. coli, I could not recover adulterated product with ozone or radiation and sell it to consumers. So the process of recovering failed product is pretty specific to cannabis. And that process is called remediation. So it's the improper use of microbial reduction technologies to recover product that is really not suitable for human consumption. And yeah, and so that process is explicitly prohibited using these technologies by the FDA. And then other organizations um, that are either health agencies or they're professional organizations that make recommendations for products like the United States Pharmacopeia, World Health Organization, um, they've all basically said that you should not use these technologies to recover adulterated product and they should not be used uh, to basically cover up poor practices. Um, do you know any of the specific methods that people are using for remediation? Yeah, so actually there was a meeting about this um, here for the Colorado uh, Marijuana Enforcement Division, um, their science and policy meeting, which was just a couple of weeks ago. And predominantly it's a radiation. And then, so I think if I remember correctly, it's close to like 80, 90% of the methods that are used and documented, right? So these are the ones that people are admitting to when they go in to their uh, government run software that's tracking everything, right? Um, it, they're going in and admitting to using a radiation and then there's a small percentage that's using ozone. Um, but there's probably many other things that are used. Uh, I know folks who use different, you know, concentrations of hydrogen peroxide, especially right at harvest. Um, to recover like basically visibly moldy weed. So they haven't tested that product yet. Yeah, so they don't know for sure that it's gonna fail, but once you can see mold, you're failing, like you have failed. <laughs> so um, like hydrogen peroxide dunks are kind of a, a, something that you hear about. People also spray different types of fungicides or um, kind of these exempt pesticides. There's a big gray area after harvest um, because it's no longer like on the cultivation good agricultural practices um, and so usually the states like um, uh, you know the agencies that oversee like pesticide application and stuff like that they they say that it's not our job after harvest that it's either like for in colorado for example it's cdphe 
Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Um, but there's a gray area there on like what you can spray, what you can apply, how you can dunk, um, what gases you can use, and a so radiation. What What do you mean by dunk? Dunk. Yeah, I mean, there's like hydrogen peroxide, for example, is a liquid. So you would dunk the freshly harvested flour. You, I mean, you, I suppose you could try to do it with dry cured flour, but you would end up with a soggy, gross mess. So it's more uh, that approach is more used uh, right at harvest when you're seeing visible mold and you don't want it to get worse. Um, but by the time you're seeing visible mold, again, that product would be considered adulterated and shouldn't really move forward in the process. Can, can you tell us about um, I meant to ask you about this at the beginning. <laughs> it's the it's the p c q r yeah yeah okay please, please explain that. yeah thank you yeah so p c q i uh i'm a p c q i so that's a preventive controls qualified individual so in food safety when you're building your food safety plan um it's kind of like a HACCP plan but it's more in line with food safety modernization act which is now, I don't know, maybe about like seven years old. So it's a more recent, it's a, it's a holistic approach to look at all of your risks across all of your processes, including your vendors and your suppliers um, and allergens, which is another thing that is separate from HACCP. HACCP didn't really include allergens, um, but now you have to consider all of those things. Um, so a PCQI will guide food manufacturers through that process. Um, and they can do some internal audits there. So it's basically uh, somebody who's qualified to really guide that food safety plan development and implementation. And they're required to be part of the food safety team when you are building these plans. And they're also required for validation of certain process control or process preventive control. So like if, for example, if you were going to use ozone to, um, uh, let's say, as rinse water in when you have apples coming in, you'd have to show that you're able to consistently get, you know, a big reduction of that um, microbe in the water. Because mostly you're worried about that water recirculating and recontaminating. So it's not necessarily there to kill the microbes on the apple. It's just preventing that recirculating water from harboring microbes. So someone like me would help guide those experiments to confirm, yes, you can apply this amount of this PPM of ozone for this amount of time. And you need to recirculate and, and add more ozonated water in or, or uh, bring in fresh ozonated water after this amount of time, because then it's no longer effective. So those types of validation experiments have to be done in food. So, uh, how do you feel about um, water quality where you're at? Like water quality in Colorado? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, water quality <laughs> is always an issue. You, you looked up and to the left. <laughs> <laughs> water quality is one of those things where um, when you're, of course, when you're in like manufacturing, you've got to care about the water that you're using. Uh, you have to test it. You have to... Um, make sure if you're getting it from a vendor that they've got all the certifications that's not bringing any risks with it and stuff like that. Um, so water is, is definitely a source of contamination in many manufacturing settings, including in cannabis is mostly drip line water, which is the, a major challenge for a lot of folks because little biofilms of microorganisms. So a biofilm is like an organized structure of, of microbes. And it's usually multi-species, like all living together in a happy little like sludge that sort of coats the inside of these uh, plastic tubes. And of course, you know, the nutrient tanks that are feeding these don't get clean typically. And they just hang on to all this delicious nutrient water. And then they feed the microbes as the water goes through the drip lines to the plant. And those drip lines can definitely harbor all sorts of different microorganisms that you don't want in your grow and you don't want your workers exposed to and you don't want on your final product for your consumers. 
No, and, and I've seen this in um, some of the restaurants I've worked at with the beer lines. Oh yeah, you got to clean your beer lines. You got to clean your beer and and good breweries will do it pretty frequently, or just completely replace them. As you um, should. As you should, especially if you got like a jalapeno beer on a, a tap line and then you like switch it over and you're like it's still spicy why <laughs> <laughs> like oh yeah because that's not gonna go away but that that's proof of concept right if it still t- mm. tastes spicy you did not clean your drip lines yep. um my husband used to be a brewer and whenever he'd come in with a new keg he would clean that brewery's drip line for them because he didn't want their beer to taste like shit because of the <laughs> of the bar wherever uh serving it so yeah if yeah don't want nasty drip lines you definitely can tell when the drip line or not drip lines but uh your keg lines you can definitely tell when those lines are gross yo i, I want to ask you a question tess and the question is um how do you cheat a lab test Oh shit. I don't know if I want to give the answer to this. <laughs> That's like, how do you build a bomb to like <laughs> explode <Yeah>. something? <laughs> well, theoretically, no. Um, I mean, there's all sorts of ways to cheat and yeah, but- people are smart. You know, people aren't dumb and they want to protect their investment and they see testing as stupid or unnecessary i've been growing for 30 years like i've never had any issues but then they've never actually tested their product so how do they know like anything about it you've got to you cannot just look at flour and be like yeah this is about 22 percent thca and i've got about you know 9200 cfu total use milk. no you've got to apply analytical tools so that's one thing i think First and foremost, there's just no internal testing across or very little internal testing across the industry, which even somebody who brews beer at a small microbrewery that employs five people, they have internal quality control and they test for contaminants in their beer and they send it out. And they, you know, there's a lot of things that you do. You have an ATP meter when you're a brewer, so you can test to make sure that surfaces are clean. So there's um, there's a lot of things that we just don't do in the industry that we should do. Um, But I think that we kind of rely on lab testing in a way to make up for the fact that there's no in-house quality control or quality assurance programs. So a lot of folks will Uh cheat the system because they think it's dumb, but then they're not doing anything in-house. So like, you can't call it dumb if you're not also testing your own stuff. So, um, I mean, there's lots of ways to cheat you can select the samples that you want. You can only treat like from a microbial perspective, you know, you can just treat the samples that you're sending. If, if your lab doesn't come and pick them up, um, you can just keep submitting to multiple labs until you get the results you want. That's another way people do it. That's not, that's not lab shopping. Yeah. Lab shopping. Yeah. Um, uh, I think remediation is cheating. But I also think that it's um, dangerous and poor practice and not good for consumers. Why, so, why do you think that, Tess? So there's plenty of evidence. Um, okay, so first of all, it's poor practice. You can't do it with anything else that we grow and harvest and eat. And our lungs are actually much more sensitive to these microbial components than our stomachs are. So not only do you have to worry about living microbes on the plant, matter, which typically, I mean, there can definitely be living microbes, um, but a lot of them will die off during dry, especially bacterial populations. Um, And, you know, if they don't, then you had, you had a lot of microbes on there to begin with. So, uh, so, you know, you've got, you've got the microbes on the product. And when you remediate, you know, if you failed, let's say in your state, the total yeast and mold cutoff is 100,000 CFU. That's pretty generous. That's what the rec level is for Michigan, for example. If you hit 200,000 CFU total yeast and mold or 500,000 or a million, I've even seen uh, C of A's on products that had a billion CFU. And at that point, you're like more microbe than you are cannabis plant, (laughs) which is not good. But uh, so you can have these really, really high levels and you can basically just treat 
that plant that plant product with ozone or radiation, radio frequency, there's a couple other methods out there until you get below that threshold, but you haven't erased away those microorganisms. So those microorganisms didn't just disappear. Their skeletons are all over that product. And not only are living microorganisms a potential threat on that product, you can, it's been shown, we've known this since the 60s, that when you smoke a plant product, that it actually creates little bioaerosols. So those are tiny little um, particulate matter that contains living organisms and their bits and pieces. So we call them bioactive agents or biological agents. And these are bits and pieces of their skeleton, their cell walls, their cell membranes. And those bits and pieces, our immune system has evolved over millions of years to identify and mount an immune response. And so not only could you potentially get infected with a living organism, but even if those organisms aren't alive and they're dead, they elicit basically uh, an inflammatory response in your lungs, which over time and chronic exposure is linked to more chronic pulmonary diseases like COPD um, or chronic bronchitis or emphysema. And those types of diseases are, um, you know, not as acute or as crazy as somebody smoking weed and getting an asp getting aspergill an aspergillus infection or aspergillosis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but they can be just as harmful in the long run. Uh, boy, Tess, you're, you're killing it here. I'm <laughs> just blabbing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, I really, um, you know, talking to scientists, like, like I told you, I went to school at, at WPI. It, it was cool. It was, <laughs> but I was not a good scientist. And, um, some of these other things like, um, the, the, uh, preventative control mm -hmm. stuff, like, um, that, that's really what I'm interested in here. Uh, I'd like to know sort of. Because I've seen a lot of people that have that, especially with the big um, corporate sort of companies, that they have problems with controlling um, powdery mildew, right? Thing, things of that nature. And I'd like to know. And it seems like this is your thing here, P C Q I or, <laughs> or, or, or whatever. Yeah. 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 Please. Yeah. So, like, how do we apply some of these? preventive measures um, to the cannabis space. And some of them are gonna translate well from the food industry. Some we might need to go into other controlled environment agriculture or CEA good practices. Um, but I mean, basically uh, the industry hasn't started with good practices in mind. You can kind of do whatever you want as long as your product passes third-party testing. That's not how things are done in food. In food, you might send out product once a quarter. Um, you don't send every single lot out to be tested by a third party because you're testing every single lot in-house and keeping very, very rigorous records. And when anything fails, it's on you. It's not on the third party testing lab. So it's all backwards in the cannabis space um, in that the onus is not on the manufacturer or the cultivator to prove that they're proactively uh, addressing all of the risks, including microbial risks or biological risks from a PCQI perspective, um, you're not that they don't have to prove that they're uh, proactively addressing that. All they have to do is hit remediate on, you know, metric or on biotrack and be like, we're good. So that's <laughs> that's the bass backwardsness of cannabis. Um, and I've mentioned this, I, I kind of mention this all the time, even dog food is produced with more oversight and safety for the end user than cannabis is, which, cause it's governed by FDA Food Safety Modernization Act or FISMA and cannabis has nothing like that in place. Um, so there are lots of things You're that not. manufacturers yeah. could do. Um, one would be just to implement, a, get a sanitation team going, not, not like, you know, the guy who's already worked a 10 hour shift and now has to work another hour cleaning up a room and mopping with 10% bleach, but like a real sanitation team with logs, with confirming that you 
are getting really low levels, if not no levels of microbes in your drains. Like even in food manufacturing, you you can't have you can't have you know pathogens on your product, but you can't even have them in the environment that you're making your food in. So you'll swab drains, you'll swab door handles, you'll swab the conveyor belt that everything's running down, and you have to send that out for testing and confirm that the environment that you're producing this in is clean. And, and that's something that is part of your environmental monitoring program, which is also something that the cannabis industry uh, should be adopting. So, um, you know, and a lot of these facilities, like, so I, I like to separate it out into the cultivation side and to the manufacturing side. So cultivation to me sort of goes all the way up until harvest. Then there's an overlap between manufacturing and cultivation during dry cure. Um, and it really turns into a product then after dry cure and anything you do to mill it or, um, you know, make pre-rolls or even making solvent, solventless extracts, then all needs to be handled appropriately like you're in food safety, um, in like a food manufacturing environment. And then of course, any, any manufactured products, any formulated products, if you're making gummies, other edibles, even vapes, those definitely need to adhere to food safety guidelines, but they don't. You go to the uh, you go to the dispensary and you're like, I'm going to eat these gummies. They're like any other gummy that I eat, right? No, they have no food safety at all. So they just have to pass testing at the end. And like you said, like we were talking about, there's lots of ways to cheat. So um, and there's no onus again on the manufacturer. They just are like, oh, we better recall. And I mean, I just got another MED marijuana enforcement division here in Colorado, another notice today about another recall for flour in the state that had exceeded TYM levels and had aspergillus in it. So, um, yeah, so there's a lot of things that people could be doing on the cultivation side, um, really controlling your environment, making sure you have uh, environmental controls in. A lot of these buildings have been retrofitted to grow cannabis and you can't, they don't have the right HVAC, they don't have proper air circulation or a number of air turnovers or filtration. Um, so making sure you have a good handle on, you know, your plants will grow clean if they're in a clean environment. Um, and then on your, uh, and then making sure the water going to those plants is clean. You're regularly flushing and cleaning your drip lines or replacing them. <clears throat> that that was a big issue that I really wanted to talk about was yeah. the, the water quality going into these plants. Because um, even here in Vermont, we're, we're seeing a lot of um, PFAS chemicals showing up in the water. Mm, I see what you're saying. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of like um, weird. Um, um uh what's it uh, algae blooms and oh yeah and they can produce toxins too yeah so I i'm curious to hear um your thoughts on on water quality if you have any yeah so most cannabis cultivators do have to have it depends on the state but they do have to have their water tested i think it's once a year but that's the water that is going into the facility not the water that's going to the plants so one thing that I do when I go on site is I have an ATP meter. Uh, ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. It's the energy currency of life. So anything that's alive will produce ATP and can be detected by an ATP meter. It doesn't tell you what it is. It doesn't tell you how much is there, but it tells you that there's life there and you need to clean, essentially. Um, clean and sanitize, because there is a difference. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so what I'll do is I'll go around. There's a uh, hygiene makes an ATP meter that has swabs for surfaces called ultra snap. And then there's aqua snap total and aqua snap. There's another aqua snap one, but basically aqua, you know, it, it tests water and you, um, basically take, it ends up pulling about a hundred microliters or 0.1 milliliters and it puts it in this little assay you break a little ampule on top, you shake it up and you put it in the ATP meter and you can see if there's basically stuff growing in your water. And what I'll do is I'll go right to the source. So I'll go to basic the tap or the RO system or wherever 
and it'll usually be clean there. And then as you work your way down, you know, into your new tanks, into your drip lines, into your plant, it gets progressively dirtier and dirtier and dirtier because those new tanks are very rarely, if not, if ever cleaned out. They usually just have nutrient water sitting in them like all the time. And the drip lines are not being cleaned, at least in a routine manner that can prevent those biofilms and other microbes from growing in there. Um, so that's a basic tool that anyone can do to in-house verify that their cleaning is actually getting the cleaning efficacy that they need in order to make sure that the water getting to their plants is clean. Um, and then also substrate like cocoa core, cocoa, even rock wool. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. It no, comes no. with all sorts of Trojan horse little microbes in them. Even the rock wool I've tested has it sometimes. So uh, cocoa core is basically just ground up coconut husks. And if you look into how the, it's uh, manufactured, a lot of times they sit in these big like outdoor vats for like years and years and years. And they might go through like a rinse with water, but anyone who knows anything about microbes knows a rinse is not going to kill things really. It's just going to maybe remove debris and a, a maybe a chunk of the microbes that are there. Um, so, you know, and, and when you look at the microorganisms that you can find, and this is well documented in the literature too, uh, for different microbial pathogens, like, cause you can even bring in plant pathogens and then you're like, oh, I changed my cocoa and I've got a crazy like fusarium outbreak. I wonder where it came from. Oh, it's probably your cocoa. And there's really no requirements that those manufacturers test and uh, and provide clean cocoa. You know, they're like, oh, we're just a garden supplier. You know, so really? that's something that it's that's not a lot of requirements for that shit. No, no. So that's why it's. But it is on the cannabis cultivator to vet their vendors and to test their product or to ask for the CFAs that they've tested. When, when I've reached out to cocoa manufacturers, they're like, you know, and I've talked to them about uh, any CFAs to, to show that they've tested. Most of them uh, are like, that's outside our purview. It's on, it's on the cultivator to make sure that they are, you know, properly treating the cocoa before they use it. So some people will soak in like xeritol, which is a combination of hydrogen peroxide and paracetic acid, um, which has been effective for a lot of folks that I know. Um, that way it's clean, but then you're, you're spending a lot of money on cleaning agents. Uh, in, in animal uh, research, so when, speaking of killing a lot of mice, when you're working with mice in, yeah, <laughs> when you're working with mice in laboratories, you know, you grow them in pretty much aseptic conditions. So you have to actually autoclave their bedding. So they come like they have little wood pellet beddings. It depends on, on you know, what they grow and even their food, you have to autoclave it all. And autoclaving is basically a retort. You're getting up to, um, you know, above boiling because there's a high pressure and high heat. And so that will kill a lot of stuff. It's basically canning. So that's like a nine log reduction. Every time I say log reduction, that's a, a tenfold increase. So a, a one log mm. is a 90%, two log is 99%, three log is 99.9%. So um, it's like a nine log reduction to go through a retort. And some, when you're working with animals and doing research, you have to do that uh, because microbes can play do all sorts of things to your mice and mess with them and you don't want that extra variable when you're doing research so there's uh there is some potential there where you could basically sterilize your substrate if you've ever grown mushrooms or anything you have to do that anyway um so it depends on how bad the cocoa is and how much you don't trust it and also what your budget is but a lot of people do zero tall soaks what uh I had some friends that did some experiments on 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 mice when we were in college. They experimented with um, uh, drugs on mice, and and it was fascinating research, and I really loved it. And uh, ooh, but the the stories they told me about the mice, where a, a lot of mice died for science. 
Yeah, <laughs> they do. They do. <laughs> I know the NIH is trying to reduce that. It, like if you can use an in vitro setting. So like basically in a Petri dish, they're like, go for the Petri dish first. Don't just go straight for the mice. You know, how can you reduce the number of mice that you're using in animal uh, research? So they are trying to push for that. Um, but sometimes you got to do something in a real living organism when you really want to make sure that it's going to have the effect or, you know, do whatever you think it's supposed okay. to do. What's the other option? Um, babies? <laughs> Probably <Is> not. <laughs> yeah, but like, you know, so I assume that's why they do it on, on uh, mice because... Yeah, yeah. Well, and mice have different metabolisms too. Like there are certain drugs that will work on us and won't work on mice and vice versa. I mean, look at chocolate. We can eat chocolate all day long, but if I gave chocolate to my dog, it would kill my dog. So your metabolism, there's all sorts of things that are different, but even between closely related species. Um, but, you know, you can do you can do some basic research like in a Petri dish and see what you get there. That's usually where you want to start. So that's starting with cell lines, which are... Um, there, it depends on what you're trying to research, but if you wanted to show that this doesn't have liver toxicity, you could treat a cell line of liver, liver cells. So they've basically become immortalized. You can do all sorts of things to immortalize cells. And then you can keep passaging them over and over again in little Petri dishes, and then use that as like a surrogate for what would happen in the liver. Huh. Cool stuff. Yeah. <laughs> And, and I, I should have told people, if you wanted to hear me sound stupid, this would be the one. No, no, no. <laughs> no. And, you know, a lot of that basic research of like all like everything we talked about. I mean, I'm coming at this from a very microbial perspective, but not that much is really known about um, the different adverse reactions to cannabis users. You know, we talk a lot about people who have panic attacks and. I think like once when cannabis was first legalized here in Colorado, somebody jumped out of a window and they were like, that's a cannabis attributed death. And it's like, you know, yeah, it, it's not me too. Yeah. And Someone jumped out. Of, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and, and how cannabis interacts with other drugs, which we know it, it can, cause it, it interacts with certain liver enzymes. So it can affect uptake and metabolism of other drugs as well. And we don't, completely understand that. Um, but we really don't have a super good handle of the actual like biological risks. So that's again, what I'm focusing on um, for cannabis, because we test for certain Aspergillus species, we usually test for four, but there's 250 Aspergillus species. And there's also other species, and they're not all pathogenic, which means they don't all cause disease. Wow. Um, and there's also other organisms that have been associated with cannabis use and infections that we don't test for, like Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Rhizopus, which is a, a mold species. Um, there's other types of organisms that we think are associated with smoking contaminated weed, because again, microbes can survive combustion and be breathed in as bioaerosols and go basically directly into your blood, depending on how small those particles are, because really small particles that are like two microns or so in size can basically directly be absorbed into uh, your lungs. And that can pose some pretty significant uh, risks when it comes to microbes. So um, we don't know, there's not a centralized database for this. Like I said, again, we can compare to dog food and uh, you can go on to the FDA website and look for dog food adverse reactions. And you can see all the dogs that have gotten sick or died from different dog food and what it was. And, and even some people who've gotten sick of eating dog food, which you got to be real hungry to do that. <laughs> but there's nothing like that in cannabis. So you can't go and be like, oh, here are our major risks. Here are like more chronic risks from use over time. And there's no, there's not a lot of research dedicated to this again, because it's a schedule one drug. It's really hard to get good data on, um, as a medical practitioner, which I'm not, but, um, to get people to just accurately report that they use cannabis can be really hard. 
And then on top of that, there's just very little, if not any funding out there to study cannabis um, besides like, you know, diversion programs and, and, and making sure kids don't smoke and stuff it, like that. It so, seems like most of the studies that are being funded are studies that are looking for negative effects of cannabis. Yeah, actually, there was, a, I think, a paper that came out saying that. And like, there are positive effects to cannabis, too. And I don't mean I don't want to be the boogeyman here. But coming at this from a product safety perspective, we need to really understand where these risks come into your process. Because if you have, if you're failing for aspergillus, for example, where is aspergillus most likely going to come from in your process? Well, it could come in with your cocoa. We know that. Um, well established. It could be in the air if you don't have good ventilation. Um, it usually, from my experience, it's it's a saprophyte. So it's a specific type of mold that really only feeds on decaying plant matter. It's not necessarily infecting plants. So that's another thing. It's not like a plant pathogen. It's just around at some basal level. And then if you don't have a very good control of your dry cure, you might see it flare up because that's what it likes to eat is decaying plant matter. And that's exactly what that plant is doing. And as a cultivator, post-harvest technician, you're trying to control that so that you're not losing a ton of terpenes, but you're also not giving an environment that those microbes really like to eat, you know, basically. So um, that's something that if we started to understand where these different risks, like Pseudomonas aeruginosa, another, it's a bacterial organism. It's a gram negative, bile tolerant gram negative bacterium. Um, so if in your state, they, they test for BTGN, it is in that group. Um, it, you know, those types of bacteria are usually going to be in a more aqueous environment. So you would expect those, and I've seen them, in drip lines, in your nutrient tanks, and then maybe getting into the plant. So they can also be plant pathogens. So they can go into the plant and infect the plant, then they can go in and infect you. So they can infect both plants and humans, uh, depending on the strain of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So, um, you know, understanding how these microorganisms are getting into your process is really important so you can prevent them from ever setting foot in your process. And that's something the industry just hasn't quite gotten to. They rely too heavily on cleaning up at the end with remediation. Again, taking a failed product and recovering it, basically testing it until it gets into compliance, which you can't do in any other. Right. And, and, and I think that gets back to the point of sort of um, addressing root causes as opposed mm -hmm. to treating symptoms. Yeah. And like a root cause analysis is something that is like, I mean, in, in the food world, all these things have acronyms, you know, because they're just used so much that you can't use the whole word. You just got to make it an acronym. So like CAPA, corrective action, preventive action. That is something that you have to do anytime something comes up outside of spec and failing your final product is outside of spec. As much as it's pretty normalized in the industry, it is outside of spec. And you'd have to go back and identify and address that you are, identify the problem and address it and confirm that the measures that you're putting in place are actually uh, are addressing the problem. Not just like, oh, we looked back and it was, a, it was a sprayer that we hadn't cleaned and now we cleaned it and we're done. It's like, no, you gotta go back. You gotta test that sprayer every, you gotta confirm that your new cleaning method is, is, is uh, um, you know, really addressing that contamination that built up in that sprayer or whatever. And if you fail again, it wasn't that sprayer. It's something else in your process. So that's you now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's you. You're doing something. Uh, so, so yeah, that's sorry. My dogs are barking in the background. Oh, no, I don't I care. This too. <laughs> so, yeah. So that whole root cause analysis, like, and if anyone is like listening to this and is like, yes, I want to do this, you've got to start somewhere. Right. And it's better to just start trying than to just sit there, twiddle your thumbs and rely on remediation to control your problems. So um, go online. There's tons of free materials out there for performing a root cause analysis, CAPA. Uh, ASTM has a pretty cheap program. Uh, it's like a half day training 
that I, I did back in like October this past year um, with David Valancourt. And it was great. Like it goes through, like, how do you go back and identify? Cause you got to start somewhere and you got to start building logs of this. How many times does this happen? Does it happen in a certain time of the year? Is there a seasonality to it? Is it when you switched over from a different cocoa or you switched, or maybe you got some new clones in from, from a, a provider and now all of a sudden you got all this botrytis everywhere. Like making sure that you are understanding these things. Yeah, is, is really what needs to happen. But then the, the manufacturers have to put resources into that because I know, I know cultivators want to do this. Like all the boots on the ground folks that I know are like, yeah, we know this is a problem, but we're not given any extra people or any tools or any resources or any training to do this. So like, what are we supposed to do? We just got to do our job. And it's like, I get you. It's really on, you know, the upper management and the decision makers of the company to make sure that their people have the resources, training and tools to do this properly. And that's another big hiccup in the industry, because if you don't have to do something and you're not going to probably do it. And the industry is also run by folks who Yep. like to look at spreadsheets and optimize grams per square foot and they don't realize it's a plant and that you got to grow it, you know, and you, you got to tend to it. <laughs> so that's another challenge in the industry. They just want to see their ROI, baby. I want to see that ROI. It's like, well, you're not going to get a very good return if you don't address these issues now it's because they're going to keep making, costing you every time. It's different than making widgets on a fucking CNC machine. <laughs> True. <laughs> True. <laughs> Or like doing stock exchanges or, or financial advising, stuff like that. Like those are all spreadsheets and, and like, you know, trying to hedge the market and stuff like that. This is, this is growing weed, baby. And you got to do it clean and you got to put in the resources there. So, yeah. Tess, <laughs> I'm at the end of my list here. I want to thank you so much for your time tonight. This has been fantastic. I hope we can do it again sometime. If there's any um, shout outs or shameless plugs you'd like to do, <laughs> uh, now is the time. And um, uh, Tess, Adam, yeah. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I'll just uh, say thank you for inviting me. Um, for anybody who's listening, I have a website, roguemicrollc.com. And I have a bunch of resources on there. So if you're like, I like what you're saying, I wanna share this with my manager, I wanna share this with you know, the decision makers in my company, go to my website. There's tons of free materials on there that show basically outline like how to grow cannabis clean, how to grow herbs clean, how to um, manufacture things in a clean way. Um, go and start reading, start educating yourself go and get some certifications um, and ask your company to pay for it because this is the way the industry is going. And uh, I think everyone de definitely wants to do better and knows that they should. And now is the time to start doing it. So um, yeah. And I just like to thank other folks in the industry who have supported me and, you know, cause for a while I felt like I was screaming into the void, but now I feel like there's a good support network there. Um, and yeah, keep it clean, everybody. <laughs> Very good. Thank you so much for joining me. For Tess Adam, I am Caleb Teske, reminding you that the devil's in the detail. What, what, <laughs> what's my punchline? Uh, the devil, oh, wait. Uh, the devil's in the details, and the details are in the fine print. There it is. Nailed it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tess. Peace. Bye. <laughs>